I heard you guys were going to eat. Lunch and learn is what the phrase was. So you guys have all eaten already, I take it? Good. So a fed group is a happy group, right? Oh, yeah. My name is Mike. I'm a physical therapist. I work over at the Health Specialty Center. Um, Would you like me to do that for you? You know what? So you can start. Sure, that's great. That'd be awesome. This could be way more than needed, so you can leave some in the back there. Thank you. So Sean, I believe, had um, inter uh, had emailed somebody from Health Partners and asked about a couple of people to come and speak to a group of you um, regarding a couple of topics. And I believe you've already had the first talk. That's correct. Um, and I think the name of the first person was it? Uh, oh goodness, what was her name? Um, the dietitian. Anybody remember her name? Anybody remember what you learned? Yeah, I remember that her and her son going to go that weekend to a, uh, a triathlon. A triathlon. Or, uh, yeah. She was very thin. Yeah. Okay. She was very <laughs> thin. <laughs> <laughs> so she ate right. Yeah. Well, good for her. That's that's great. So, no, she had a lot of good stuff. Excellent. Um, so my, my topic today is actually going to be on another component of um, health and wellness, which is going to be more on the um, physical activity and exercise component. Okay. Um, so just by, sh you know, I'm going to start calling out professions. It looks like we have some people in the trade of construction. So why don't you stand up when I when I um, called off what you do? Any police officers in the group? In the group, one police officer. Um, any uh, office staff here today? Why don't you go ahead and stand up? Um, this will be your kind of one opportunity to get some activity here, right? Starting out here. Um, park and Rec few folks here. Great. Uh, community education people. Construction, I, I see some yellow vest, construction. Public works. Okay. Yeah. Public works. Who have I missed? Have I, have I got everybody? Admin. Yes. Okay, administration. Okay. So some jobs, you know, there's quite a mix within the group here of, you know, being more on the active side and probably more on the um, sedentary side. So um, my talk is really kind of tailored more for both parties, however, um, uh, you know, it's probably going to lean a little bit more toward the inactive person because um, oftentimes if you're not as active as somebody who's active, you need perhaps more ideas, thoughts, um, ways of looking at um, currently what you're doing and how, can you, how you can change that essentially. So, so I might be bent a little bit one direction and if that's okay with you folks, I'm going to proceed that way, okay? Um, <clears throat> You know, one of the things that I've done over the past seven years um, since Health Partners began um, a task force in, the, in 2005, and they had people from different walks of life um, get together and talk about kind of what folks are doing for activity and exercise, and um, with, with uh, the population as we know it getting more and more unhealthy, um, they're, they're became a, an instance where Health Partners was really guided toward trying to address that a little bit in some way. And so I became involved as the physical therapy entity. There was physicians, there was dietitians, there was psychologists, there was administration folks, there was all different folks that came together to sort of create a, uh, an idea or a way of looking at what we can do to help folks um, out, essentially. Um, some of that may have been uh, surgically directed, but we also came up with a package where we did education programs. So we did classes, so that was really the, the what we birthed out of that process was um, we did education classes. And we, that's changed over the past basically five years or so um, to now where we're doing classes in groups of four where we um, have people come in, they learn about um, healthy eating habits and healthy exercise habits and sort of a combination of things because psychology is involved as well. So we all kind of do our thing. We all are kind of so quote unquote experts in our field. Um, we uh, ha have desires to sort of um, act toward you know people to help them out the best we know how and for me i've been involved with the process this process for a number of years now and i've given a number of talks to a variety of groups and you know there this might be probably one of the more active groups that i that i've interacted with um, and if you're not as active as you'd like to be i think that this talk will be very appropriate for you as well so um so hopefully we can touch on finding some common thread that will work for um for you all um, that will make this process 
both meaningful and helpful. And if you take away one, maybe two things out of the talk, you know, I view that as a success. If you take more out of that, fantastic. Okay, so that's what I'm after today. <clears throat> um, so I'm just going to kind of go through some of my objectives that I hope to kind of go through, but um, uh, they're not listed out for you in your handouts that I've given you, and I'll go over those in just a moment. But just as a way of sort of um, launching off into what we're going to cover today, I, I guess I wanted to make sure that all of us understood the benefits of um, a more active lifestyle because it's really, that's, that's what, you know, this is about, this, this topic is about for me today is to talk more on that. Um, I wanted to kind of identify ways and help you perform more activity if that was possible. Um, we could discuss uh, strategies to overcome barriers that might come up on a daily basis that might kind of prevent us from being more active than we want to be. So hopefully as a group we can come up with um, some possible solutions for how we can help ourselves out with that. Um, we'll uh, also you know, attempt to set a goal or two at the end of the session today because I think um, without any intention, lectures are kind of not as meaningful as they are intended to be. And I want everybody to kind of leave here with at least one thought idea that you potentially can change over the next week and maybe um, we'll come up with, you know, writing it down, maybe putting it someplace so that you can look at it, um, so that you can try to at least start out in the right foot and, and start heading in a direction that I'd like to see us go. So, um, and then we're going to talk a little bit about self-monitoring tools because I think without um, a way to sort of track how we're doing with certain things. Um, you know, it's not risky, but it's, it's good to know kind of, this is a safe way to proceed if you're not currently active and you'd like to begin to be more active. So I want to give you a couple of tools, and those are all kind of in the handouts there. So this would be a good time to look at the handouts. Um, some of you have already flipped through them a little bit, but on the first page of the handout um, are basically kind of the, what I think are the biggest pearls that I want to give you today, okay? The first and second page gives, the first page kind of gives you the how-to. How do I start? Um, why, do I, why do I want to do this? And all those kinds of things. And really the last part, the things that are kind of highlighted a little bit there, they talk about a couple of things that have changed over the past basically four years. Um, every 10 years, um, either the uh, American College of Sports Medicine, the uh, um, Oh, I'm blanking on the other, the other group that does this, but they, they evaluate how we're doing as a whole in society. And they give us markers to kind of look for um, and, and grow towards. So uh, they came up with new markers in 2008. So what you're looking at there is sort of their new kind of instructions with how they want people to view activity or exercise, okay? Um, and so that's gonna be on the first page. The second page, if you flip that over on the back side, um, there's sort of the, if you're active, how do you get more active? If you're not active, how do you begin safely? So I've given you some tips on that, and that's not my information. I, I've completely pirated this information. So um, I worked at the APTA booth um, in 2008 when this kind of came out, and we did a Wii Fit demonstration at the State Fair. So kind of cool, people came in, they got to play. You know, people love that. So, uh, but, but what we did is we talked to people about kind of increasing their activity levels and increasing, you know, if they're just starting, how they would do that safely. And so you can kind of look through that. We might spend a little bit more time with that um, as well. The next two pages involve exercises that are, you know, perhaps designed more for somebody that's not necessarily getting to a gym. Um, my understanding is that you all are potentially gym members in some way. Is that a benefit that's provided to you by the city of New Britain? It is? Okay. I see some nods. So. Um, so when I heard that family is also, you get a, a discount on family membership. So if you're already doing a health club program, great. These are not to replace, these are not designed to replace them. In fact, some of the exercises that you see, you know, if you add a machine, you know, some kind of a resistive machine, it's basically what you're working on with those simple exercises. But if you don't make it to the gym and that's not something that's your style, then I think you should take a look at those because they're simple. I teach. 85-year-old men and women to do these exercises, not because I think that they're, um, they're the only population that benefits, but I would also teach somebody in their 40s and 50s how to do these exercises as well, because they're just common threads that I see with people as they age, things change, flexibility lessens, strength decreases, and that's just the way it is. And so if there's a way to kind of counteract that a little bit, um, certainly doing something as simple as those exercises might be useful. And then the last page, last two pages, there are some self-monitoring um, ways to, to look at sort of if I'm, if I'm going to be active or increase my activity level, 
how can I proceed safely? So I want to give you some tips on that. Um, again, your um, knowledge of yourself, your body, kind of how you respond to things is really what I think is the most important because I'm just giving you guidelines. I'm not giving you absolute recommendations because you know what's going to work for you will not work for you and will not will probably you know may not work for you it may not so it just it really does it really is variable so just to kind of put it into perspective listen to your body know your know your limitations know what you can and can't do and try to just proceed safely that's what I recommend everybody does okay um, the last page is what I would just call sort of a page that you can use as your, you know, at your leisure. I would post that one on the refrigerator. We'll talk a little bit more about that one um, down the road. But I've done some different things with that with different groups, and I think it's a great page to look at just for variety. So, okay, how are we doing so far? Good. Okay, <clears throat> activity versus exercise. Okay. Um, <clears throat> Some people have issues with me speaking on exercise. Others could care less because they're engaged in exercise. Um, so I tend to call all of it activity. Because to me it's like it's just specific. It's more specific. And I think that um, some people get turned off by the word exercise for some reason. And I don't want to, I don't want to offend anybody or turn anybody off. But um, I just want people to be aware that, um, you know, uh, or whatever you want to call it, it's just sort of looking at something a little bit differently and kind of shifting it. Maybe it's a paradigm shift that, hey, we need to be talking more about activity and how we support that, either individually or as a family or um, collectively as a, a, as a group, essentially. So, um, and networks are pretty key. So um, oftentimes if there's more support, uh, it, it's, it's, it goes better. If you can talk about it with somebody, if somebody asks you questions about something, it often works better. So um, be, be looking at that, looking at your resources, who you have available, how you can support that. Um, that can be very helpful. So we can launch right in. Right? The, the thing at this point is, let's, let's talk a little bit about benefits, OK? Because um, it's really hard to, to say that exercise or activity, and I'm going to start using just the word activity from now on, because I think that's more helpful. Um, it, it pays off. And everybody can essentially do it. It makes a difference. And it's proven over and over again with study after study after study that it works. So I don't have to, I feel I really don't have to be up here to justify activity. Okay? So what we're going to talk about is some of the benefits. Okay? So the most significant benefits um, that I'm, that I'm going to just sort of report, and these are the ones that are proven with, you know, over and over again are. Um, one of the most important ones, I think, is it can reduce your mortality or extend your life, essentially. The more active you are, the healthier you are, the longer you'll live. And that's just been shown over and over again with studies that have looked at people over a long period of time and what they've done and what they haven't done. Um, it can improve your cardiovascular health. We all know that when you aerobically are active, um, uh, you tend to develop uh, improved ability with your cardiovascular system. It can, lower, it can lower obesity. It can lower the, ability, the um, uh, girth measurements around your torso. Um, it can help you with osteoporosis. So if there's any of you that have um, concerns or of osteoporosis, and it's not just a women's condition. Uh, men have osteoporosis as well. And as you know, menopause transition occurs, less estrogen is in our body. And essentially, our, our bone buffering, our bone protective qualities decrease significantly. So if you're not doing things to counteract that, either by taking calcium or vitamin D and exercising, um, you're not doing as much as you need to be to kind of you know, counteract those, um, those negative things that can occur. It has been shown to lower breast cancer. Uh, and it also has lowered the risk for diabetes, especially adult, adult onset. So the more active you are, the, the better your numbers are, um, and the more likely you can kind of get out of that um, type 1 diabetes. It also has been shown to reduce um, depression. And anxiety has been strongly associated with anxiety as well, but it's, depression is more the one that it, it, it tends to do more for depression than, um, than the other. But both has been shown to be pro to, to progress. So those are kind of the, the proven benefits. And those are um, significant because, you know, if you think about it, if, um, if activity um, is present and you have any one of those situations, the therapeutic value increases the more active you become. 
because all of those are helped by just increasing the level of activity. Um, and if you can maintain a good level of activity, um, you're going to be better off in the long, long run. And so that's really what we're, what we're after, is to just sort of look at that as, hey, you've got a pretty powerful tool. Um, we just need to sort of use it. OK, good. <clears throat> Questions on that information, on the benefits? Did you get a handout? You came in late. Get a handout. Awesome. Good. Um, so definitions. We'll go through a definition here because I think it's interesting. Physical activity. Anybody know what the definition of physical activity is? It's pretty simple. It's any movement that expends energy. That's the definition. So if you stand up or did hula hooping or um, bent out to pick something on the ground or did anything, that's activity. That's really what we're talking about. And I like to talk about activity as something that we need to sort of shift the way we think about. Because if we can change our input to activity, exercise, aerobic, stretching, strengthening, mm -hmm. it is all the next supporting layer. So the foundation for me is always, it starts with activity. So we have to look at activity and try to see if we can change any of that. I've got a silly question for everybody that, um, that's sitting here today. Who, um, <clears throat> who parked in a close spot to get to this meeting today in the parking lot? Okay, That's a habit that I'm guilty of as well. I, you know, I, I, it's something that I've done all my life, and I think it's a game. And I, you know, I just feel like you know, the closest spot wins, essentially. But really, the closest spot probably doesn't win, because guess who gets to take the least amount of steps coming into they're talking. For me, I had to run across the street to City Hall, and I went in that building, and I went up and down some stairs. And then I went over to the community center prior to coming here. And then finally I came here, so I bet you I got a, you know, a thousand, you know, some steps just walking around figuring out where I was supposed to get this done. <laughs> so, so, um, so the idea is that, you know, there are ways that we can kind of look at what we do and change our activities without really changing our behaviors much. You know, it doesn't take us time to want to, to really park the farthest place away. And I, you know, the bigger the parking lot at the, you know, at the um, Mall of America or something like that, the more steps you're going to consume, actually. But, um, but even places like this where you could have the potential opportunity to take a few more steps, um, it could be meaningful for you. So you have to look at the little things that you can do as far as changing the activity. Okay. Um, and there's more examples that we can go into later, but you know I'm going to talk a little bit more about that in a minute here. Um, so, as far as uh, the question, because I think some of us have questions. You know, why am I here? Why am I listening to this talk? Is you know, am I actually here for weight management? You know, is this a talk on weight management, or am I just trying to you know create um, better cardiac health? And whatever your reason. Um, or maybe it's just to learn some, some tips about how to be more active. Whatever your reason, you just need to come up with one reason to learn something. And once you come up with that reason to learn something and then make a change, that's how it starts. And the smaller the increment does not make it less meaningful. Okay, So if you change one thing today, even small, it's, it's going to change potentially your life for the rest of your life, which I think is pretty significant. And I want you to think about it that way. And so for me, one of my main lessons, so one of the main take homes, which is worthy of writing down, but it's too simple to write down, is that a little activity is better than no activity. That's the most simple thing I can tell you. And more is better than some. Okay? So I'm never happy. That's what that tells you. <laughs> I'm never happy with myself. But I also realize that I start someplace, and I have to progress from that location to something more. Okay? So if you can remember one thing from that, you know, I think that that would be the most significant thing to remember. So um, we'll blast, we'll kind of go down to the point, the talking points in the bottom of the first page. I'll let you read the first the upper part because I think that's self-explanatory. Um, is there another handout? I'll grab one more handout so I don't have to look looking over somebody's shoulder. So the time frames. 
um, looking at the time frames as far as um, activity levels go because uh, there's really two significant time frames. And if you're active, um, you might have a slight advantage in this category. If you're less active, you might want to go more toward the starting category. But you know, the two, the two categories are essentially the moderate level and there's the vigorous level. And there's categories that describe those in detail, which I have not included in the talk, unfortunately. But, um, but you, can get, you can get that what moderate and what uh, vigorous activities are, and it's kind of explained at, the, at, the, at the, the bullet points below those. So moderate activities, essentially what, you're, what they're asking folks to do to stay healthy is to be active two and a half hours a week. That's 150 minutes, okay? Now if you do the math, the vigorous activities are only an hour and 15 minutes, so that's half as much. So that's only 75 minutes, okay? So um, the idea is that the more vigorous you are, the, the, the quicker you get your heart rate up, the faster you're breathing, and so on and so forth. Um, you will burn potentially more calories in the same amount of time, okay? But we all know that if you walk two miles or run two miles, which do we burn more calories with? Walking or running? Run. Okay, you're running. Any other answers? Same. It's the same. So the, the difference though is, is that the person who runs two miles gets it done faster. So they're more efficient with their time. So they can move on to something else. So it's the same number of calories. And that's really what we're after, is that you look at things in terms of how you're, how you're burning the calories, how much you're burning the calories, and looking at that as a way of sort of checking in with yourself. What am I after? Am I after, after heart, heart healthiness or am I after weight loss? And you make a decision if it's one or the other category. And then you get to come up with your plan with what you're going to do about that. Okay, if you're just trying to be more heart healthy, well, you may want to stop with, start with walking and get that walking level up to 30 minutes at a time before you consider running. Because we always tell people in physical therapy clinic, we see a lot of runners in our clinic, we do a lot of video analysis, um, we tell them if you can't walk for 30 minutes without pain, you should not be running. We have some other tests too that kind of let us gauge with what we're doing with them. But we see everybody that we see for running, most every people, um, they're coming to see us for a problem, for a pain issue, okay? And they're not um, currently running as well as they could be running because something's hurting them. So we have to kind of keep track of that. But if they're not able to walk and do their ADLs, um, that's a sign that you don't want to progress too rapidly. That's a yellow sign, do not proceed with caution. Be aware of the fact that hey something's not quite healed you need to kind of keep working on whatever the problem is if it's strength or if it's proprioception or if it's just control so um, so those are some, some things to think about if you slowly build up the time to do the activities over time starting very little you know I, I tell people start with five minutes you know if you haven't been doing an activity for a while and that could be as simple as I'm gonna walk on the treadmill five minutes is better than going 15 and hurting afterwards, okay? So we all kind of get that. And start start in palatable spots, palatable amounts so that um, it works better for you. Um, <clears throat> the more time you spend, the more health benefits you gain. If you doubled those numbers for moderate and intense activity, if you were to double that, you would double your potential health dose and that would give you more benefits. It's like a stronger prescription for whatever ails you essentially, or it keeps you fitter as long as you're obeying, you know, your body and kind of recovery and all those kinds of things. Because doing too much, we all know that we can do too much. And we see runners that run every day, and sometimes five to seven times a week, but they also come to see us eventually because they're overuse problems, okay? So be aware that oftentimes your tissues, especially as we age, um, need time to recover. It's very common. We, we all need that um, day of rest in between activity, especially if we're working hard, lifting weights, running, um, even playing sports, for example. Um, and many sports are kind of relatively less active. Um, I don't know how many, you know, I'm playing a softball team in the summertime. Some of you might be on sports teams, I don't know. Um, but, uh, you know, of our group, I think, over the, over the course of the summer, I bet you we had eight injuries on a softball team, you know, at one time or another. We played eight games. We're all middle age, <laughs> you know. Uh, youngest players probably in their, you know, late 30s. Oldest players maybe, you know, 55. So, you know, when you have that sort of um, feast or famine, 
you sprint hard, you stop, there's potential for problems. So you need to kind of uh, allow appropriate time to warm up um, and then just appropriate time to stay warm while you're doing your activity because there's a lot of downtime in some sports. So <clears throat> The second part, or the last part on the first page has to do with muscle strengthening. So one of the new recommendations, so the guidelines above were really drafted with the idea that you could do it any amounts you wanted, okay? And I'm going to propose that, um, you know, you do it at least three days a week, but there's been no data, no science to say that you can't do it all on the weekend, okay? So if you wanted to exercise on the weekend and get your workout done for the week, people do it. And they, they fulfill the requirements. It's fine. People are busy during the weeks. You know, I'm busy. I, I get home late in the evening. Um, I have work to do with my kids, homework, um, and then I do notes when they go to bed, so I'm up pretty late. So we all get to decide how we want to break down our time. Um, some people break it down in increments of 30, but really the most important thing I think is, is that if you can break it down into increments of 10, 10 has been shown to be meaningful, okay? There was a study um, that looked at uh, oxygen utilization in a population of women I believe between the ages of uh, 50 and 65, um, they were overweight. I don't believe they had any pre-morbid pre conditions, meaning like they had arthritis or anything like that, or some other pre-existing condition. Um, and they put them into three groups, and they studied them over a long period of time. And they looked at the oxygen utilization, which is a biomarker for cardiovascular health. And what they found um, with the first group that exercised 10 minutes a day um, for seven days a week for, I believe it was three months, was that they made improvements. 10 minutes a day, that's all they did. So if you're looking for the minimum number, because some people want to know, okay, what do I got to do to be meaningful? Because I, I look for numbers like that. What am I going to do to make the most bang for my buck? But what, am I gonna, what do I got to do to be meaningful? And I look at the minimum benefit. Well, this, this study, still, study showed that they, they improved their oxygen utilization by 4.1%. It was significant. So the group that doubled that amount um, increased it by six. And the group that tripled it did 30 minutes a week, which was kind of the previous recommendation for activity, moderate activities, um, they improved it by 8%. So each progressive jump led to a greater gain. And that's what it's all, that's what I think you need to kind of be aware of. A little is good though, is, 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 as I said, some is better than none. That's, that's the, 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 the take home with that. And if the study group was surprised by the results. They weren't expecting the, the, the initial group to gain anything. Because you know what they made them do? They said, you either stationary bike or you walk on a treadmill two to three miles per hour. That's all they had to do for their allotted amount of time. So they didn't do a lot. So if you're looking at categories of is that light or is that intense, that is the lightest of the light category. Okay, because I think you know, even for a modest activity, I think you have to bike, I think up to 9.5 miles per hour is still considered moderate activity, but when you get to jump to 10 miles per hour or greater, that's considered intense. So if you're looking for a speed, hey, how fast do I have to bike to get intense? Well, you'll know it by breathing. <laughs> There's a, a definite rule of thumb when it comes to moderate versus intense activities. And the rule with moderate is that you should be able to carry on a conversation with your neighbor, okay? That's considered moderate. But if you can sing the, sing the national anthem, that's probably considered light. You can sing while you're doing the activity. However, if you can only get a few words out before you catch your breath, that's considered more intense. Okay, so cycling, running, those kinds of things would be considered more intense. Heavy gardening, that you get your heart rate up. Um, wood chopping, those kinds of things would be considered intense activity. Where lighter stuff would be biking, walking at a slower pace, 2.5 to 3.5 miles an hour perhaps, um, uh, those kinds of things. So, um, so hopefully that helps. And the next page over, I just discussed those two points. And I do have the list of things that you can do for moderate and vigorous activity. It's located right in front of my eyes, in your eyes as well. So it just gives you sort of a list of, you know, if you're looking for a laundry list of things that you can do, um, the first thing is find out what you like, what do you like to do? I mean, that's always my first question. When people ask me, how do I get active? How do I get more active? What do I do to make that possible? The first question really has to be, what do you enjoy doing? What will you commit yourself to do? Because it has to be meaningful for you. Because if I say, go biking, and you hate biking, who's going to bike? Who's going to do that? 
So it has to be driven by you, okay? So find out what it is you like and what you enjoy doing and start to do that. But don't stop with one thing. I want to encourage you, know, to, you to kind of be creative with this process because I think that the more creative you are, the more likely you're going to tend to stick with something and do it, okay? Um, the more solitary, some, some people like to do things in solitary, some people like a small group, like a partner. Um, you know, I encourage you to get what you like. You know, what, what works for you, do it. I'm, a, I'm more solitary. Um, that's just kind of the way I do it the best, and I can be more intense than it. I don't have to worry about it somebody else. But many people, you can, you can kind of double up and, and combine activities with other people. And the nice feature about having a partner is, is it holds you accountable. And there's, a, there's, some, there's some real um, meaning behind that and real, there's some, some useful, uh, it really help, helps you to kind of follow through with what you're planning to do, especially when you talk to somebody else about it. <clears throat> Does anybody own a pedometer in the group here? Show of hands. Four. Are you wearing it today? Do you wear it? When do you wear it? If I can ask. I go in phases. Okay, so you wear it for a few days or weeks at a time? No, I'll wear it for six weeks at a time and then I'll wear it for a while and then wear it again. Okay. Why else do you use the pedometer? Who else raised their hand over here? Yeah, is there a, re a reason if you care to share? Um, how often do you use your pedometer? Not very often. Not very often. Is it stay at home uh, or do you have it on? It's in my underwear drawer. Okay, got it. Over <laughs> <laughs> put it on top of your dresser, then you'll see it every time. Or put it next to the door when you leave. That might kind of give you a tip for that. So when do you use your pedometer? For what? Uh, treadmill versus treadmill. Bike, okay. Which is if treadmill says three thousand or three miles, and I run what I know is a known three mile run. Uh -huh. It compares it up. It's more curiosity. Okay. Yeah. A lot of people use it because it's tangible. You know. Um, I, I wore mine today, but I don't wear it every day. I mean, I've, I've been wearing this thing for seven, seven years. Some days it works, some days it doesn't. Hey, it's working today. So, um, so I'm almost at um, 2,800 steps, okay? Um, for me, that's kind of an average day. So I you know, average about 5,000 steps at work. And I used to think, and this is maybe true with some of you, um, is we kind of, I used to think, oh, I easily walk 10,000 steps in a day. I mean, you don't have to ask me twice. Oh, yeah, 10,000. Oh, gosh. Yeah, I, I'm back and forth in the hallways, you know, buzzing to patients and all that kind of stuff, back to my office, back to the hallways, you know, whatever. Um, but what I find is that most of us over-report our activity. We, we sort of think we do more than we do. And this really kind of made me honest with my activity because all of a sudden it's like, I'm not getting 10,000 steps. I'm getting about half of that. And that was a little like, oh. Gosh, I need to be doing more than I'm doing because there's a recommendation. Health Partners came up with this 10,000 Steps program in the 1990s. They were the first group to, to come up with this program. Um, and they looked at 10,000 Steps because most people don't achieve that in a day. Okay? But not everybody should start at 10,000 Steps. That's a goal. For me, it's like my goal was I wanted 10,000 Steps. So that was my goal. I set out to, to make 10,000 Steps. But I had to walk a half an hour in the evening every night to do it. Um, just something extra. You know, so for me to get that 10,000 steps, I really had to do that extra piece. So I, I looked at that and I kind of use it as a, a reward. It's like, to me, I, I achieved my goal. I felt good about my day. But you know what? Um, to me, it doesn't matter you know, how many steps you achieve. It's just a way to track what you're doing. And then you can start to you know, gain insight in what it is that you're doing that's consistent, reproducible, and then you can set a goal that maybe just increases that a little bit. And being realistic with yourself is really the key. Because for me, if I only had 5,000 steps, I wouldn't have set a goal for 10,000 steps, but really I thought it was pretty easy when I walked the dog in the evening. I thought I could easily get it, and I, and I could get it if I just really would take the time. And, and you know, it really, for me, it was a time thing. So, um, and so for you, whatever, whatever the goals are, but that was just one kind of way, and I think you have to find little tools like that um, to sort of help you to start with activity, because you build your activity, and you do a couple of days of strength training, which is what the recommendation is with your, this, um, these new standards, um, and, you've, and you're on track to something much more meaningful. So before the standards were, they didn't actually talk about strength training so much. It was more about just the activities, and they said 30 minutes five times a week or more, basically. Now they say, do 30 minutes twice a week, and then do a 90-minute session on the weekends to get your 150 minutes. 
So you get the 150 minutes and they say, get it any way you like because science doesn't say that one way is better than another way. They can't prove that, so they say, do it any way you like. Okay, so that was kind of significant. I think some of you look tired to me. Okay, so um, so what we're gonna do is we're gonna stand up and normally, <laughs> normally I wouldn't necessarily do this uh, this piece, but we're just gonna do a couple of things, okay? Um, we're gonna, we're gonna kind of go through the first page of the picture handout. There's strengthening exercises, then we'll go through a couple stretches, okay? So everybody stand up. This is your way to be active in a physical activity talk. <laughs> so everybody stand kind of on the back side of your chair. Just to give, you know, give yourself some gentle support if you need it. And then we're going to have everybody just raise up on your tippy toes, okay? And then come back down again. And then when you come back down on your heels, I want everybody to lift their toes up so that you're going back on your heel as well. So you're going to not only go up on your tiptoes, but you're going to come back on your heels. It's a little harder to kind of keep your balance a little bit, so this is a little bit more balanced training. This is my gas station activity. This is what I do at the gas station. I find little ways to squeeze things in, okay? Um, but I figure it's a nice, helpful way to kind of keep my ankles loose. I don't have problems with ankles, and I just hope I don't have to have problems with my ankles, okay? but I do things like this to help that, okay? Simple activity, all right? Second activity, now everybody, you know, stand in front of your chair, but, you know, like you're going to sit down. So switch, or switch around, so pull the chair out. Now, nobody's going to sit down, but everybody's going to kind of make the motion like you're ready to sit down. Everybody widen out your stance so that your heels are on the inside of the legs of the chair. Now, if you're, one, if you're, in, if you're a gym person and you work out, this, this looks very much like a leg press, and it is a leg press. You're getting the same muscles working, so everybody's just going to slowly sit down on their chair, nice and easy. Don't touch. Okay, then go ahead and come back up again. Good. That's nice and easy. We'll do this maybe five times. If you've got knee problems, or if you don't want to do extra, these activities because you're concerned, I never care about that. I'd rather you be safe than sorry, okay? so. But most people have to do this activity, what, 20 times a day, 30 times a day, 40 times a day, every time you get out of a chair or your car, whatever. So this is a nice way to kind of work on building up your strength in your quads and your glutes, okay? Last one. One more time, nice and slow. Good. This is like convict, what do you call it, convict conditioning? It's convicts, they don't have any weights in their cells. I prefer low tech. <laughs> <laughs> Next exercise, everybody go to the back of the chair again. Um, so you're going to hold on very carefully to the back of the chair, and you're going to lift the leg out to the side, keeping your posture from tilting. Everybody stays tall, good posture, no tilting. I don't want to see any movement or minimal movement to the side, then switch and go the other way. So the less the movement, the better. This isn't easy, is it? These little lame exercises that this therapist threw in a handout, they're not as easy as they look. And you know what we find with runners? Notoriously, these runners that, that um, have weakness in their hips, they do not do well with this activity. You throw a TheraBand on them, they've got no strength this way. Why? Because they run this way. They don't run this way. Okay, so if you think about it, you're going to be strong in the direction you're moving, but not so much in other directions. So runners really don't do well with this activity. <clears throat> I am always surprised at how weak I am when I do this exercise. This is like the one exercise where it's like, it, it's on the edge of hurting when I lift my leg out to the side. And if you're the same way, it's normal. It's not a big muscle group. These are teeny muscles up on the side of our hips that don't do a lot for us except keep our support and control when we're on one leg. They keep us from doing this. That's what they do. They support us and hold our pelvis up when we take steps from one foot to the other foot. So the next exercise is an arm exercise. Oh, you do have arm rests. We'll do that last. The lunge. So everybody kind of stands sideways. So you guys face this direction. You guys can face inward, so you're facing each other. So you can have your hand next to the chair. Everybody take a step forward. Nice and easy. Bend down comfortably as far as you comfortably can go. And then return back up again. And I want to challenge you when you come back to try to, when you come back, be as smooth as you can without having to use support. And then go the other foot, so we'll alternate. 
nice and smooth and controlled. Everybody's looking good, you guys. Everybody's working. This is, <laughs> this is one of the bigger groups I've taught with, and everybody's doing it. That's awesome. <laughs> um, is it painful and cracking or just cracking? Just cracking. <laughs> so if it's painful and cracking, I'd say maybe not um, such a great exercise. But if it's just cracking, follow a therapist around the clinic. You'll really get a sense for the symphony in our clinic, the percussion in our clinic. So. Um, Good, excellent. Last exercise, everybody put your hands on. Why don't you pretend like you're gonna sit down, reach back for the armrest of your chair. Good, and what you're gonna do is sit down. Push up, come on. Gotta get these, get these flabby muscles toned up. Good, and you, you can just work on an exercise like that. Nice and simple, low tech. Most of most everybody has an armrest. Okay, we can use them. We have wheels on our chair. We do these extra these activities. So, yep, not a problem. So it's a nice, simple little exercise because you use your body weight, which is usually more than a five pound, seven pound weight, because you're lifting your whole body with your arms. It's quite a good exercise. Okay, good. So these kinds of things are recommended to be done two to three times a week. Um, the recommendations in the booklet are twice a week, but I say two to three times a week. Um, and you're, you're going to start out with like 10 repetitions, do two to three sets of 10 repetitions with each of the exercises, the activities. It doesn't take long to get this done. You know, we spent less than 10 minutes and we got through everything but the last picture. And I sometimes don't do the last picture with people because um, it's more problematic, stepping up on something. Um, you know, we don't have steps. And then I s I'm forced to sort of tell people about stepping up on their chairs, and then I start to get concerned that somebody's gonna hurt themselves because they're stepping up on a chair and doing something like this. So just be aware I don't, I'm not crazy. I want to just make sure you're all safe when you're done today, okay? Good. So then, you're saying three sets of 10, but how much time between each set do you recommend for recovery? That's a good question, a fair question. You know, generally speaking, I think a minute or two minutes is probably all you need. So that you could you could go from one machine to another machine. If you're at the gym and doing some strength training, which is more specific, go to another machine, but then you might lose your spot. Then move to another machine, and then go back to your first machine. So just keep track of it. You know, for me personally, I'll do 30 reps. Personally, this is what I do. I do three sets of eight, my first time on a weight, if I'm satisfied with my weight and I've selected it properly. I'll do that, and then I'll progress up a uh, rep a set till I get to three sets of 12, 36 reps. But I, I don't stop at 10, I just blast through. I'm a blaster through, I wanna get to business, get it done, move on to my next thing, you know, so. And I, I gotta say, I'm not, I've been not very good about going to the gym until this month I, we, joined, we joined a wise a family because we had a, a need um, in the family to kind of join in, so now I'm, following through with my 12 frequencies so I can get that 20 bucks off. I'd probably spend it all on gas going there. <laughs> but I still do it because it's an incentive. And for me, it's like I need these little sort of incentives to kind of be, you know, stay motivated and do what I intend to do. So for me, it, it makes a difference. Um, and, you know, family discounts for a lot of folks you can get. My wife works in another facility. She works, you know, she does 12, I do 12, we get 40 bucks off of a membership. All of a sudden, 110 bucks is down to 60 bucks. 70 bucks that's a pretty that's a pretty good palatable amount you know when you think about it so um, and our son goes and our daughter loves it so we have a blast there so <clears> that next page um, I probably won't have you go through this one this one may be more meaningful if you if you're a gym person that, that the previous page you may not need that previous page but most people don't spend a lot of time with stretching stretching is kind of one of those anomalies where Boy, you either do it or you don't. And I find most people just don't have whatever. There's, there's a time, there's issues, okay? So it's something to think about. And I, I, I'm gonna recommend that you look at that page. It looks, it really addresses all the major muscle groups in your legs. The first picture looks at uh, stretching out your calves. What do we find as people age? Older people have tighter calves. About the age of 55, 65, 75, older they are, the tighter the calves are, unless they're active. Now it all can be ameliorated with activity. 
Um, so we always like to make sure that people get calf stretching because when their calves get tight, they're walking slows. When they're walking slows, they're less healthy, period. Okay, so a faster walker, this has been studied and shown to be true, a faster walker lives longer, period. Maybe because they're not tipping over sideways because they're walking so slow, because they're walking this direction, they're able to kind of maintain an upright posture. But people that tip over sideways tend to do what? Hurt themselves, break hips. You know, not that people need to focus on the negative, but a broken hip in an elderly person above the age of 65, for example, a third of those people don't make it their first year. One third remain institutionalized, and the other third, the other third will get better. But that's a pretty high risk for having that kind of a problem. So stay healthier. It's a very, very easily done thing and, and can be done. So um, the next extra, next stretch in there is for the hamstring. You can put your foot up on a nice step stool. Works great, but this is a little higher. And generally speaking, I just kind of, I try to keep a little flex in my knee so I'm not stretching my sciatic nerve. I don't, nerves don't like to be stretched. We all may or may not be aware of that, but your knee's straight, that hinges around a corner in your buttock, called your ischial tube, a bone, and it stretches down this direction, so you're tugging on both ends of the nerve, and the nerve says, I don't like to be stretched, so don't stretch your knees with them straight. Stretch that, stretch the hamstrings with them, slight, slight bend in them, that's gonna work better for you, okay? Uh, the bottom picture, middle bottom picture, just, you know, staying tall, tipping your hip, stretches the inner thigh of the side you lean toward. Stretch both directions, you've taken care of that quad. So, um, the next picture on the top addresses the top muscle, top front thigh, quadricep. You pull your foot back if you can, if you can't, don't worry. There's lots of alternative things to do for that, but potentially you can do something as simple as just bending down, but that requires a fair amount of strength on the other side. So, um, or if you're not, don't want to stretch that one out. Don't. It's they're just sort of they're just suggestions. And then the last one looks like the lunge picture, doesn't it? We've already done that exercise. So as you're working on the the foot in front is strength training, the leg in back is hip stretching. So you're stretching your hip flexor by doing that particular motion. So you kind of get two for one with that one. Okay. So I just thought I would give you a handout like this, just to give you something tangible to look at, okay? Um, hopefully that's meaningful. And these are all for 30 seconds, all for 30 yeah, seconds? Yeah, yeah, and um, I think I wrote, didn't I write that? 30 seconds, three times a week, yeah. So two to three times a week, yep, is, is fine again. So stretching is kind of one of those things where it doesn't have to be done every day. Activity, every day. Exercise, you know can be split up kind of the way we talked about, whether it's moderate or intense activity, you can split it up any way you like. Um, good. Strategies for self-management. So let's go to that next page there. And I just wanted to just kind of go through this fairly quickly. Everybody can find their age on the horizontal line for, um, oh, let's, let's stop through the first one. We already talked about this already. If you can't talk, you're working too hard if you're a new exerciser, period. If you can't say a few words and you're doing an, an intense workout, before you have to take a breath. Well, you know, it depends on how long you've been doing that. So just be, be wise with that kind of activity. But it, again, if you can sing the national anthem, anthem, you're probably not working hard enough. So work a little harder if you can. The second one is the one that I don't want people to get hung up on. There's a lot of, there's a, there's a second part B formula in there. I don't want you guys to get so hung up on that, but I gave you a tool to kind of look at. Um, you can all find your age across the horizontal line. We can use the um, two part A, training heart rate, and it starts out with a 0 0.65 to a 0.9 range. So you would multiply 220 minus your age times that number. If you're a new, new person to activity, do the smaller number. If you're more seasoned or kind of intermediate, pick a middle number. And if you feel like you've been working out, pick, the, pick a higher number if you want to. And then plot that on the line. You do your activity. Where do I fall when I take my heart rate? Does everybody know how to take their heart rate? Quick, quick drill, you can go on the wrist, two fingers lightly, usually you kind of turn your hands a little bit right on the wrist and you feel your radial pulse. If you struggle with that, you can slide off your Adam's apple, pressing lightly into your neck, and you can take a pulse. Usually we just have people count zero, one, two, three, and so forth, up to 10 seconds. But we start with zero. 
Okay, that just kind of makes everybody use the same kind of method, essentially. And you can plot out how many beats per minute you are with an activity, and you can see if it falls in the gray zone for your age group. And if it does, congratulations. You're in, the, you're in a good zone. Now let's say you're taking heart medication that slows your heart rate. This formula becomes absolute, you know, you have to talk to your physician about that, okay? Because I'm not, this is, that's beyond the scope of this topic today. So I'm not touching that topic if, you're, if you have, take, you know, some kind of medications that lowers your heart rate. So you need to talk to your physician, find out what a, an appropriate heart rate is to be active and, and, and moving in. I think that that's a healthy thing to do, okay? Good, and then the last thing that I have there, number three, um, deals with a kind of an abstract uh, measure of perceived exertion. So it's called the Borg scale, and we all can rate what it is we feel um, we're exercising at, we're, our, we're, our activity level is at. And so generally speaking, the um, sitting there, as you're doing right now, is a six. Now if you can, if you feel like you're gonna um, pass out with exertion, you're at a 20. So everything in between is kind of how you rate yourself. So if you do take cardiac medication, this is a nice scale to utilize because it allows you to rate how you feel, okay? And that can give you a ranking, and usually we like to see people in the 12 to 14 range for moderate activity, slightly higher for, for more um, intense activity, okay? Good. So I'm gonna open up for questions because I know we had an hour, but I also wanted to say that we never really got to some of the barriers, although we kind of, I sprinkled in some barriers throughout the talk, so um, I hope you got something out of some of the barriers. You know, like a lot of people, you know, I, who has barriers with activity that would be willing to share one barrier that they might have um, with regards to activity? What might be one reason that you have? We can just briefly talk about that just to check in and we'll open it up for questions, or we can open it up for questions, whichever. Anybody have any? Monotonous. Boring. Boring. It's just, you've been doing it for so long now, you're just tired to get going, keep it exciting anymore. Anybody have any thoughts for, for spicing up a routine that's just kind of, you know, past its prime? I don't know. Music's the only thing that helps me. Yeah, music. Um, well, I'm gonna propose something here, but, um, what about varying what you're doing? You know, and, and if you're a gym, I don't know if you work out in a gym or if you work out, you know, some other way or some people run or what, whatever they do, but um, on the back of your form, there's a list of 50 ways of being more active. Now, none of those are real strenuous and they're more designed for the sedentary person, but look at, okay, what, what are some things that I enjoy doing? So I think you have to kind of take a personal inventory. What do I like doing? What's fun? Sports? Is it, um, you know, I like to go canoeing, biking, skiing, whatever it is, and find alternatives that you can kind of do which could sort of replace that a little bit. Um, you know, having variety is really the spice of life, and the more variety you have in your routine on a weekly basis, the better. Now, another thing that you could think about, too, is how many of you plan for activity on a weekly, like a, like a Sunday afternoon, you, you, you know, some people might plan their menus for the week. I don't. Some people do, though. Um, what about taking that time to kind of plan out, okay, this is, this is how my week looks. For example, today, I'm giving a talk this afternoon. I'm not going back to work. I'm going to go home. I've got time to do something this afternoon, okay? So I'm going to take advantage of this day, okay, to do something with the family. I'll probably take my daughter for a walk if it's not so windy that we get blown away, or we'll go to the gym or something tonight because she loves that. So, um, but, you know, taking a look and doing some inventory right away on a Sunday, and saying, this is my week ahead, these are my opportunities, how can I maximize that? That would be one possibility to make it more fruitful. So that's one thing, boredom. Any other thoughts as we've talked? I mean, I'm surprised nobody said time. Who has time to be active nowadays? I mean, I would use that classically for my reason for not doing just about everything. I can't fix my basement, I don't have time for it, okay? But if I really looked at my day and looked at my week, I could figure that one out. 
Okay, because and in fact, I can I can double up my activity time. I can um, I can have a meeting with somebody and walk around with them at the same time. I don't have to be sitting at a desk across from them to kind of meet with somebody. So make the most of your time. Do something different than you normally do. You know, you all have to walk into the building, and if you all walk in, the, if you all park in the farthest spots, all these front spots are left open. You can walk further just walking in, or you can take the stairs to get to this floor if you wanted to. So there's little choices that you can make that involve absolutely no time. So that's the one that I think most people can make the greatest impact with. Just take advantage of the time you have, do things differently, change one thing, and set a, set a goal, okay? So the last thing we'll do is, I'll, we'll, um, I want you all to kind of write something down, maybe on the handout someplace in a location that you're gonna plan to do X over the next two weeks and make it frequency based so that there's sort of something that you're going to do and if you want to show your family fantastic <laughs> if you want to show your neighbor hey um, if you happen to see this person again in the next week or two that might be meaningful um, but think about something that you'd like to like to work on over the next week or so hopefully something has you know resonated or you know taken a hold in you as we've done this um, talk today and now I want to open it up to questions Yes. Okay. Two schools of thought, um, and I, I think I'm hearing you say probably the second one, but the first one is that you should do in chunks of like 30 minutes. That it's better for you. That was kind of the old school of thought of exercising yeah. no. your activities. Yep. Yeah. And then now I've heard that 10 minutes, 10 minutes, 10 minutes. 10, 10, 10. 10. Is That's just the new. As good. That's absolutely just as good. Absolutely. And you know what you don't do as much of when you do 10, 10, 10s? Perspire. Because that 10 minutes is like the magic line for me to kind of change in clothes and start over, or being able to salvage my current clothing and continue on with my, you know, my day. So 10-10-10 uh, is a really the, the new moniker for it because you need 10 minutes to make it meaningful. Um, and if you, multi, if you did that 10 in the morning, 10 at lunchtime, and 10 after supper, you've, you've fulfilled that you know, a 30 minute quota for a day, and if you did that twice, during the week, and then you did one longer session on the weekend, you're done. You know, so it's potential. You know, it's possible. If you did that every day, you're 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 set. Did it five days a week, you're done. You got your 150 minutes for moderate activity. So, so yes, 10, 10, 10 is the way to go. That is the new paradigm. Okay. Good question. Anyone else going to risk asking a question? I will. Yeah. If your heart rate's too high for what's recommended for a long amount of time, do you burn muscle? Uh, you would burn um, a different system. So there's the aerobic fat-based burning system, which is more moderate activity. So when you're a moderate exerciser, you're going to burn more fat. It's just readily available at that because you're not pushing yourself to a limit. When you go anaerobic, which is a higher respiratory rate, you're going to burn... Um, Glycogen, okay, which is not necessarily burning muscle mass. You know, you're not. I mean, it, a lot of it depends on okay, what's your input level and output level and that kind of stuff. But generally speaking, don't think about burning muscle mass. You're just burning a different system. But the bottom line is, is the the total amount of what, however you burn it, whether it's aerobic or anaerobic, doesn't matter. It's just the number of calories you've consumed with your activity. And neither of those, I think, with even in pretty intense activity, like if you're off the scale on the heart rate chart, um, and you've been doing that for a long time, and you're fine with it, and you feel fine, all that kind of stuff, I mean, you're not burning muscle. I would never look at it that way. But if you were to do things day after day after day and get to that level, you know, there might be some concern that you're not allowing your tissues to rest. Because, you, you know, your tissues need to be balanced, activities and rest. So really, that's the, the suggestion is, is, you know, strength training every other day, not daily, or if you're going to do it daily, mix it. Upper body one day, lower body another day, so you're not getting the same group day after day after day. Very good. Okay. Did that answer? Yeah. Okay. Good. Good. All right. How much does sleep really matter? <laughs> I think it matters a ton, because when you're deprived, there's nothing worse on this planet than being deprived of sleep, I swear. It's, that's, it's not a good situation. The more you're active, the better you sleep. That's been shown. It's not as strong of a marker as the ones we've talked about that were proven, but it does help you sleep better. Okay? Um, there's, there's been some evidence that if you could increase your, your sleep by an hour a day, 
you'd be more productive, more efficient, you'd be, so many things would take place. Um, but I don't know that, I can't find a way to do that in my life, you know, because I'm still pushing the five hour, you know, sleep night, which is not good for me, okay, because then I crash and burn on the weekends. But, um, you know, if I could find an hour a day, I, I bet you I would be more productive, I bet you I would get my work, I'd get my work done more efficiently, and I bet you I'd have, I'd have more creativity, which is, I think, what I lose when I'm tired, so. Um, which I think is the crime of it all because it's like, geez, you're working so hard and trying to you know, make things work out and then your creativity is just not as good as it was. And I feel like the older I get, the less creative I am. So, good question. Yeah? Is it a bad idea to exercise in the evening, you know, yeah. getting closer towards bedtime? Is it so that has to be handled individually. So that's a great question. Boy, should, I should, you know, because there's, and, you know, there's people that say that you shouldn't exercise close to bedtime. But you know what, I can drink a can of Diet Coke at 10 o'clock at night and still fall asleep at 11. But the rest of my family, if they took a, you know, if my mother drank a cup of coffee after 12, she'd be up all night. You know, so it's like what works for me and you might be different. So you've got to listen to what your body does. I can exercise any time, but not everybody can because they get geared up. And you know, you increase your metabolism. And that metabolism does not go back to baseline for a while when you're done. So if you can't fall asleep, if you're not tired enough to fall asleep, that metabolism is gonna raise, and it's gonna stay raised until it goes down to baseline, and you might be awake a little longer than that. So exercise when, it, when it's convenient to you, but just be aware of how, my, how you handle that load on your system and how you can shut down afterwards, because really it's about monitor your own result, um, and then go with that result and change if you, if you need to change, if that's possible. So, good question. You guys have been an attentive group. Thanks for participating. I hope you got one thing out of the talk, two if you're lucky, and then just kind of work with that. And again, write, it, write a goal, make it happen, and then see what you can do. Um, good luck. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you.